My name is Gene, and I too am an alcoholic. And when I identify myself as an alcoholic, I base that identification on how I interpret the definition of the word alcoholic as is defined in the third chapter of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, wherein it says that we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. It says no more. It doesn't say in order to qualify for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous, you've got to spend a year and a half of your life on Chicago Skid Row. It doesn't say you have to wind up in a penitentiary, lose your family, lose your self-respect. It doesn't say you have to wind up in drunk tanks, institutions, mental wards, and get married and remarried three or four times. <laughs> Just a simple, honest declaration on your part, done in what we hope is a complete state of honesty, as to whether or not you as an alcoholic have lost the ability to control your drinking. The theme of your conference is acceptance. That's probably the toughest part of that definition, accepting the fact that you have lost the ability to control your drinking for good. Many of us believe, you know, we sort of compare it a little bit with, well, maybe we can get it back later on. You know, if I get sober for a while, I'll pick it up again. And... <laughs> but it's not like that. Facetiously, sometimes in AA, we compare it with uh, virginity. <laughs> Once you lose it, it is gone. <laughs> Of course, some alcoholics are like some high flyers. They still try to kid you that they still got it. <laughs> but they know they ain't got it, you know. I was warned twice here this morning. My Mike told me to make sure I keep it clean because a lot of young people here. <laughs> Mar Marsha told me that there were some members of the clergy here, so I should keep it clean. And, and now he just asked me that. Is he going to keep it clean? I said, you bet your sweet ass I am. <laughs> I certainly would be remiss if I failed to thank the committee for being responsible for me being here this weekend. It's an enjoyable, enchanting place, this seaside. Clancy and I were walking around about 12.30 last night looking for a couple of bears. <laughs> I notice Clancy's a spiritual speaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's like having an Ethiopian talk to you about the Scarsdale diet. <laughs> you know, the guy sitting down here in the front got a t-shirt on that says, Search Fruit Bay." I imagine he's talking about Pluto Bay up there on the Alaska oil shelf. And I just happened to be thinking of it as I was looking at his t-shirt during the meeting because it gave me a little thought of what I'd like to pass on to you. I was privileged to share an AA experience up there in the state convention in Alaska about a year or so ago. And, and well, geez, I'm sure about that. It wasn't that hot. <laughs> I only say that to be funny. It was very nice. And there was Buck Inn or something like that there. Cook in, Captain Cook in, I think that's the name of the place. But the thing that was very interesting that after this was over, I was in the airport terminal there on Monday morning, waiting to go back to say I'm from the San Francisco area, not San Francisco exactly. I'm from, uh, ironically, the world's finest wine growing region. I live in the Napa Valley where all of the great wines come from, you know. Ain't the kind of wine you and I used to drink, though. This stuff costs $8 a bottle, you know. <laughs> I was sort of into that pride of Lodi, you know, about... <laughs> but as I was sitting in the terminal, it was early in the morning, and the bar was open, and I noticed this one big guy, a huge mountain of a man, you know. I guess about 29 years old, and uh, I sort of identified with him right off the bat because he was having a lot of fun, you know. He was enjoying life as life should be enjoyed, and... And, and I really, I don't know if I was envious of him or I just felt good for him. He had a big black and red checkered shirt on, you know, and them big boots that them guys wear and the suspenders and a funny old hat, you know, and, and big beard. And he was roaring and having a big old time and drinking down left and right, you know, and not really bothering anybody. Everybody around him seemed to be with him, you know. 
And as he got on the, the plane, he wound up sitting alongside of me, which was all right for a while. <laughs> because every time she came by, he had a drink and I had a coffee or something like that. He was telling me all about his experiences up in Prudhoe Bay and how he was going home. Now he had been up there for something like 21 straight months and working long shifts and overtime. And he had pooled a lot of money together. And now he was going home to Peoria, Illinois to see his wife and a baby he hadn't seen since it was born. His wife was pregnant when he left. And he now had enough money for a down payment on a house. And he was genuinely happy, you know. And I really felt good for him, and, and I don't really, not that I have the, the qualifications to diagnose it, I don't think he was drinking alcoholically, he was drinking what you and I would have referred to at one time, that fun-type drinking. I don't think it was that important, it was just fertile time, it was good time for him, you know, and, and so I, my heart went out to him. But it got a little monotonous, and you know, he told me how they drilled up there, and how they'd done this, and how they protected against the cold, and how, no, oh, you Somewhere over Seattle, he finally ran out of gas, you know. And, <laughs> and then he asked the inevitable question, and I don't say this to be commercial, I'll just tell you about it. He says, by the way, he says, what do you do for a living? Now, this guy had had about 25 shots by now. <laughs> and I happen to own and operate my own recovery facility in Northern California. <laughs> and I wasn't about to tell him that, you know. <laughs> I figured I should tell him I manage a McDonald's stand in Sausalito or something like that. You know. But what the hell? I said, I have an alcoholic recovery facility in the Napa Valley. And he looked at me and he said, uh, a what? I said, an alcoholic recovery facility. He says, what in the hell is that? And he didn't really know. And then he brought a whole new light into my life because I said to him, well, that's the place where people go who don't want to drink anymore. And he looked at me and says, why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> why would anybody want to... I get in trouble like that all the time, you know. <laughs> I just told some folks the other day, you know, about a little experience I had coming back on a plane. You know, I love alcoholics and I've been in my life for 34 years, you know. It's everything I have, and you've heard it a thousand times, is a result of alcoholics Anonymous and my own sobriety, you know. It's the greatest adventure that's ever taken place in my life, and I'm sure it never will be exceeded by anything else. I'm totally enamored by AA. And I'd love to be where AA is, you know. And that's why I make a statement sometimes that some people don't understand. I don't regret any drink I ever took. I don't regret the time I spent in prison. I don't regret the time that I spent on Skid Row. I don't re regret anything that was part of my drinking career, quote. Because obviously, everything that happened to me was necessary for me to be here April 14th in Seaside, Oregon. And I can't think of a better place to be, you know. I just pray nightly and daily that I can remember the lessons of the past that are responsible for me being here and pray that I never forget them. But I love AA so much I get myself sometimes in an awful mess, you know. I got on this plane, it was 10 after 7. Now, during my drinking career, Nobody ever offered me a drink at 10 minutes after 7. Nobody said, hey, Duff, would you like a drink? Never in my life did they do that. But you get on them damn planes, right? You sit on the plane, you're up there 15 minutes, you go up to the exit, and here she comes. The little car. Would you care for a drink? Jesus, you know, it's like dying and find out you've been reborn, you know. And I said, no thanks. I said, but I'd like some coffee with sugar. Now, there was a guy sitting next to the window in the same seat section as we him had the empty between us. And she said to him, would you like a drink? And he paused for a moment and he says, no, he says, give me some of that coffee and sugar too. And then right away, my sick mind went into operation. <laughs> Here it was, 10 after 7, and I looked at this guy and he was drinking coffee. I said, are you on AA? <laughs> I said, are you on Alcoholics Anonymous? He said, what the hell ever give you that idea? I said, well, you're drinking coffee. He says, I like coffee. I said, but she offered you a drink. He said, I didn't want a drink. I said, if you're not an alcoholic, you can have one. If I wasn't an alcoholic, 
alcoholic, I would have had a bundle of drinks. <laughs> I'd be drinking all the time if I wasn't an alcoholic. But I love to drink. <laughs> and that's what got me here, loving to drink. I didn't get here for any psychiatric or any emotional reasons or anything like that. I got here because I like to drink. You know? Shrink asked me, what is it? What do you drink? And I told him and he threw me out of the hospital. It was a VA hospital. He, he wanted some big, deep-seated psychological reason, you know. He said, why do you drink? That's because I like to screw around. <laughs> he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle it. Get out of here. <laughs> I don't need any wise guys like you. For a long time, you know, I've known why I don't drink. But uh, it was always hard for me to tell people why I didn't drink. I'm not too well adverse to the big words and stuff like that. I knew it in my gut. You know, but when somebody said, hey, Duff, why don't you drink anymore? I'd get ready to say it and nothing would come out because I didn't know how to put it into words. Well, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I guess this happened. I was invited to a place called Stockton, California. You'd never believe that place. That's like being in an empty paint can. <laughs> That's the most exciting thing you can do in Stockton, California is go through the work clothes department of J.C. Penny, you know? <laughs> I was down there to participate in an AA experience, and that's all you can call them in Stockton, California. And I was passing the time of day in the hotel that afternoon, you know, and I'm not much of a guy for watching TV or anything like that, but when you're trapped, what are you going to do? So I was laying there in the sack, you know, watching one of them Saturday afternoon classics, you know, uh, Godzilla makes it with Shirley Temple. <laughs> And all of a sudden, a commercial came on. Now, I'm quite sure every one of you in this room has seen this commercial. And how ironic, because it was advertising a beer, you know. But it finally showed to me why I no longer choose to drink, put needles in my arm, pop little pocket rockets, smoke funny little cigarettes, or that other hip slicking cool stuff that I was fooling around with. And probably the same reason why you don't do those things anymore. This commercial that came on, ironically, was filmed in San Francisco Bay, beautiful bay. And it must have been filmed on one of them fantastic days we have in the early fall there. And all the little sailing boats were out on the bay, looked like a bunch of little butterflies flitting around out there, and the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. And, and then the camera sort of zoomed in on one of these sailing schooners. And on the schooner running around on the decks was a bunch of young lads, like these guys sitting down in front here, you know. 20, 21-year-old guys with cut-off blue jeans and funny little t-shirts and weird little hats. And they were diving off of the yard arms and they were swinging on the lines, dropping into the bay, just jackassing around having a big old time. And then the punchline came on. And it said, you only go around once. Grab all of the gusto you can. And I didn't know what the hell gusto meant. <laughs> and so I went out to the desk and I got a dictionary from the guy at the desk and I looked it up. And it says, gusto, slang expression for living, why I don't drink. You only go around once, grab all of the living you can. Yeah. And only a fool, <laughs> only a fool, only a fool or a total idiot would sit in this hall or any other hall like this, any place thinking that he or she is going to get more than one shot at this thing called life. The rule is one time through, and you better accept that. You can't put life on hold. You can't save some for later. Life is sort of a cold thing when you really look at it. Ever dawn on you that the moment life starts, it begins the process of getting shorter? <laughs> every unit of time, every second, every minute that goes by is a part of your life. That is over, finished, done, used up. Every unit of time goes by, brings you closer and closer to the inevitable end of life. Now, those are cold things to say, but this is the place to say them. I can speak, of course, for myself, but I'm quite sure you'll all agree with me. If I'm selfish, then I'm greedy, because I want every bit of life I can get, baby. I want to go every place there is to go. I want to see everything there is to see. 
I want to hear every song that's ever been sung and read every book that's ever been written. I want it all. And there's nothing wrong with wanting it all. As long as you got enough common sense to know that you, you just can't have it all. <laughs> but my experience, shared with your experience, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, tells me that I can get a hell of a lot more of that life clean and sober than I can ever get using and abusing. I know that. <laughs> so because of that, I do what normal people would call silly little things. I run off three or four times a week to odd little church basement type places and school rooms and sit down on hard chairs and drink that crappy old coffee and eat them lousy old cookies and listen to our crap repeated over and over again. <laughs> and I come out of there saying, boy, I really live in. <laughs> well, if that's all it was, I can only speak for myself. I think I'd be insane enough to go back drinking. I didn't stop drinking to spend the rest of my life on hard chairs, drinking crummy coffee and eating cookies. Bill Wilson in his book says that Alcoholics Anonymous is a new way of life for those who choose to live a new way of life, free of any kind of dependence on chemicals. That's what I wanted. I wanted a new way of life. And how ironic that once that desire for that new way of life ignited itself within me, I began a process called taking steps. And yet so many people say these steps are difficult. And here most of us took some of these steps before we ever even came to AA. Think of it clearly. You don't get to Alcoholics Anonymous unless you take the fourth step of our program. That's what brought you here. Somewhere in your drinking past, you sat down and you took a look at your life. And you didn't like what you saw. Looked like your life was caving in on you. Life had become a big bunch of crap. And you said, Jesus, I want to do something about this. And here you are doing something about it. Fourth step of our program. Making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. That's all it was. And how about one, two, and three? <laughs> I call them the morning steps. You and I took them continuously during our drinking days. You usually take them with your head wrapped around a porcelain bowl, you know. <laughs> and you're looking in there and you see those well-known words, American Standard. <laughs> and you're in there trying to throw up. And you can't throw up. And you want to die. And every nerve and every muscle in your body is about ready to jump right out of your skin and you're, oh, God almighty. And you know what you're saying? Jesus Christ, I can't get off of this son of a bitch and driving me out of my goddamn mind. God help me, I'm going crazy. I'll do anything you say. That is step one, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No big deal, no big deal. And step five, that's the sense you've been telling bartenders this story for years, you know. <laughs> I've always said people who find it difficult looking at the steps to try to work the steps still have a desire to drink. Our steps are difficult, surely, when you first look at them. Because obviously they are in direct conflict on how you and I really want to live. Our steps are not difficult to non-alcoholics. They look at them and say, hell, that's simple. <laughs> and it's not until you want to not want to drink that the steps become simple because their design is a new way of life a way of life that you know you will enjoy a way of life that you want and you see the directions and you say my how simple because I have finally reached where I want to reach but until you want to reach that them steps will battle you right to your death right to your death I don't know why I'm an alcoholic I certainly didn't try to become an alcoholic intentionally. I didn't put it down as a goal or anything like that. <laughs> didn't study how to be one or do any great research, you know, but all of a sudden here I am, you know. I didn't think I was an alcoholic for about seven years while I was in this program, even though my life was in shambles, you know. I still thought like some of you, somehow, someway, someday, you know, I'll be able to drink like a, a normal person. 
Boy, when I hear that, you know, I actually get clammy, you know. I hate to put a damper on your celebration here, but I, I want to tell you something, and it's sort of cold, sort of cold, but, you know, you see signs around every now and then, it says, it's all right to laugh, but never forget that you cried. And it's great for us to enjoy the spirit of camaraderie and fellowship that exists here this weekend, but let us not ever forget from whence we come, you know. People in this room will die of alcoholism. There are people in this room, as horrible as it is to say, and as tragic as it is to say, who, who are not finished drinking. You know that, and I know that. There are people in this room, unfortunately, who've made up their minds to drink again. And before you look askance at me as though I'm originating those words, I refer you to the book Alcoholics Anonymous. That's where it says that. If you haven't gotten that far, I'll quote it. Quote, despite all that we can say, many who are real alcoholics, by every form of self-deception and experimentation, will try to prove themselves the exception to the rule. Now, we know that, and it's been proven to us over and over again in the past. But that's not too bad. You know what the insidious part of that is? The book says that, you know, we will persist in countless vain attempts trying to regain this control, trying to be these social drinkers, you know. The tragedy is that in order to fulfill those attempts, we have to put everything up on the line. You know, no, it's no longer putting a couple of bucks up there for a drink. It's the life. It's the job. It's the career. It's the kids. It's the wife. It's the marriage. It's the home. Everything we own has to go up on the bar in order to get a drink. Whether they're going to take it all or not, we don't know. But we've got to put it up there, trying to become a normal drinker. And the sheer insanity of that is you don't know and I don't know an alcoholic who walks the face of this earth who could ever tolerate the conditions that surround normal drinking for more than three seconds. <laughs> Or have you forgotten how normal drinkers drink? <laughs> I was watching something last night in that uh, place where we stay over here. Uh, what the hell is it? Shire, 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 something like that. It's a bar in there. Jesus Christ. They get up and go home. <laughs> and leave half of a drink on the bar. <laughs> really? See ya. And there's that much left in the way. And they say the damn things. No thanks. <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> Two's my limit. <laughs> they put the cat back on the bottle. <laughs> they eat. <laughs> I watched some, I just watched some not too long ago in the airport. I love to, I gotta confess to you. I like to go in, in what they call them the lounges, la cocktail lounges. I, I didn't drink with too much class, that's probably obvious to most of you. <laughs> I never knew that they had rugs in bars until I came to AA. I was totally fascinated by that, you know. And the cutest little things darting around serving those drinks, you know. And, so on the occasions that I get to go into one of them, I, I sort of eat it up. I sort of like it, you know, and the curtains in there and everything, you know. <laughs> pictures of hunting dogs and things. Like that. <laughs> so we were at this airport, my sponsor and I, and we come back from someplace, and uh, we had to wait to eat. The guy said, it'd be about 10 minutes delay, we to go and have a drink, you know, the big hustle. So we went in there, and we were standing down the end of the bar, right at the little hook in the bar. And there was a little, little round table right down by it. The cutest little table you ever saw. My mother would have put a fern on it, you know. A <laughs> little round thing. And had two little chairs there. And a nice, good-looking young couple, about 21, a couple of them skinny-butted skiers type, you know. <laughs> they come in and they sat down there. And I liked the guy right off the bat. I couldn't hear him, but whatever the hell he ordered came in the biggest damn glass you ever saw in your life. <laughs> Looked like a candy dish, your great big thing. And had all sorts of stuff in it. It had olives in it, onions in it, little dead fish. And, <laughs> oh, oh, 
sorts of things. And I got all excited when this guy put it down by them, you know, and so I was standing there watching them. Because I wanted to see, you know, what do you do with this? Do you, how do you get it at it with a fork or what the hell are you doing? And then they did something stupid. They started to talk. <laughs> then they ate them olives. They fooled around with that little fish. <laughs> now, I know really it, it wasn't as long as I thought, but it seemed like an hour and a half to me. But I came in there saying, for Christ, they drink that. <laughs> Drinking is important to me. <laughs> now, there's no sense in ordering it if you're not going to drink it. You want to talk? Stay out of the sidewalk. From it. <laughs> but I tried to research, you know, why I became an alcoholic. We all get wrapped up in that, why we become an alcoholic. Why me, you know, and all of that. I don't know if this has really got anything to do with my drinking or not. Uh, I'm born and raised in the Lower East Side of New York City, which is not exactly Disneyland. And, <laughs> and a lot of people say your, your trouble started when you were young and all that. I can't recall having any problems with alcohol as a kid growing up. I had a lot of other problems with the New York Police Department, I assure you of that. But uh, I can't recall doing any kind of, uh, what well, you hear nowadays, school-type drinking or smoking a few joints or cutting a few lines or anything. I don't remember none of that. I was running numbers for my uncles and things like that. I was in the hubcap business, and uh, and I didn't go to one of them nice type high schools, you know, that have them nice names and them rich neighborhoods, you know, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow High, you know. <laughs> the school I went to had a number, didn't have a name, you know. If it had a name, it would have been Lucky Luciano Tech, <laughs> Al Capone Prep. You know. Driver's education in our school was how to leave the scene of an accident. <laughs> Mugging one and two, things like that. <laughs> I had enough trouble that early in 1941, prior to World War II, a couple of detectives visited me and they took me down to 90 Church Street, which is the federal building in New York City. And in the lobby of that building, they gave me an alternative. They said, before you leave here today, you're going to do one of two things. They're either going to be sentenced to a year and a day at Rikers Island, which was New York City and County Juvenile Detention Facility, definitely not Disneyland, or you're going to voluntarily enlist in some branch of the military even though you're underage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to fool anybody in this room by thinking I'm a very patriotic devil or I wanted to protect all of womanhood and motherhood and defend our shores and all of that. It just made more sense to me. <laughs> But I'd be better off in some branch of the military than I would to uh, Rikers Island. So they took me up to the Navy recruiting office. Now, I want to tell you about me when I was 16 years old. I was a snotty-ass, wise-ass, punk-ass, shitty-ass, snotty kid. That's all the hell I was. I thought the world owed me a living and today was payday. <laughs> I would have mugged my grandmother if I knew she had 15 cents in her purse, you know. My whole world up until that day was about 40 square city blocks, of which I knew every inch. I knew every rooftop, every alley, every manhole, every inch of the sewer system. But outside of that 40 square city blocks was a whole world that was totally alien to me. I knew nothing about it. On a clear day, I could look across the Hudson River, and I knew New Jersey was over there. And somebody had told me that if you went on up through the Bronx and through Westchester County, you'd eventually come to Connecticut. That was about the extent of my geographical knowledge. I went into this Navy recruiting office with an attitude that, what have you got to give me? And that didn't work, because I had words right away with the chief yeoman in the Navy. You ever see a chief yeoman in the Navy? They sit out there in the middle of the office, you know, and they got the crew cut and the ruddy little cheekies, you know, and little white teeth and stuff. They look like they come from Iowa, you know. <laughs> And uh, before he even got a chance to talk, I told him what ship I wanted to be on, or <laughs> what fleet I wanted to sail with, and of course he, he didn't listen to that kind of crap. And he let me know that in some nautical terms, which, which upset me, you know. <laughs> and then I expressed a few opinions of my own in some street terms, 
which really upset him, really upset him. He got so upset he came out from behind his desk and he started beating on me pretty bad, you know. And when I came to, and that's exactly what happened, he knocked me out. When I came to, this should be easy for those of you who are alcoholics, I was lying on my back out in the corner. As I shook my head into some sort of reality, I looked straight up. And standing over me appeared to be the biggest man I'd ever seen in my life. You know, he looked like he was 19 feet high. Everything looks out of height, you know, when you're down like that. I had a pair of royal blue trousers and a red stripe up each side and a dark blue tunic on and choked at the collar and a bunch of red and yellow crap all over his arm and a yard and a half of stuff up here and a white hat. Looked like Wallace Beery. <laughs> and he said, hello, tough guy. <laughs> Jesus. Well, I knew I wasn't tough, 132 pounds. You better not think you're tough in any city, you know. But I liked this guy. I had no idea what his interest was in me. I had no idea that he had been talking to the detectives while I was laying on my back. But he took me into a little office and he gave me an eye test without even turning the light on. <laughs> right? He just let the light from the hallway shine in and he said, you got good eyes, you got good eyes. <laughs> then he took out a fake baptismal certificate. And he said, what's your mother's maiden name? So I told him, he says, write it over here with your left hand. I said, I'm not left. He said, what did I tell you to do? So I scribbled it with my left hand. And he says, now write your father's name over here in the right hand. And he says, I'll take care of the name of the priest in the church. And I'll also handle the date because you're going in the Marines. Cool. <laughs> well, there was no war. There was no war. <laughs> So I went to hell, you know? <laughs> I looked at that uniform and I figured this guy played in a band or something. You know? <laughs> so at 16, I went into the United States Marine Corps. Now what was to happen that night, I believe, is what happens to all of us. Oh, maybe not in a train going to Paris Island, South Carolina. It happens in different places. Let me tell you what happened to me. I told you I was just a punk-ass kid come out of the 40 square city blocks. And I got put on the train with six other guys. I called them old guys. They were 19, 20-year-old guys. But they were big guys. They were the kind of guys you see in the marine pictures, you know. 6'3", uh, Victor McLaughlin, John Wayne. Big guys, like not a punk like me. And I was on there with six guys just like that. Now, this will be no big deal to those of you who are the native of the West. But boy, to me, it was a big deal. One of these guys was a real cowboy, a real one. He didn't have a fake hat on or nothing, you know, had dirt on it and all that. And, and he talked about riding the range and, and fencing and roping. And, and geez, I'm sitting there in complete awe of this guy. Only guy I'd ever seen on a horse in my life was a New York cop, you know. And Jesus, this guy talked, I just took it all in. And right in the middle of his conversation, he did the damnedest thing I ever saw in my life. He took out a little bag out up here and he made a cigarette with his mouth. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I had never seen that, you know. <laughs> and I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted his hat. I wanted his shoes. I wanted to make a cigarette with my mouth. <laughs> but I couldn't. And that desire only lasted long enough till the next guy started to talk. He was sort of a liar. Because so at first he said he was in a circus. He was an aerialist, he said. But what he really was, he was a stagehand with a burlesque show that traveled around with a carnival. But his job allowed him to be backstage when the strip teasers got finished their act. Wow. Now, I know that's no big deal today in our topless society. It's very permissive nowadays. Topless is hardly nothing. But in 1941, for a 16-year-old virgin, man, that was the deep throat of my day, you know. <laughs> and I wanted to be him. <laughs> and then the other guy, it took me about three years to figure this out. He was a merchant seaman. And he said he had lost his ship in New York. <laughs> for three years, I figured, how the hell can you lose a ship? <laughs> And in order to escape whatever kind of punishment I guess they were going to deal out, he had enlisted that day under a fictitious name into the Marines. But what was so exciting about him was only a week prior to being there with me, he had been in a place called Reykjavik, Iceland. God, I was jubilant. I was a world traveler. 
You know, I was with a guy from Iceland going to South Carolina, getting out of New York, you know, and I hadn't even left Penn Station yet, you know, in the train. <laughs> But that was the night it was going to take place. That was the night I was going to discover what you discovered. Because on our way to Washington, D.C., we got friendly enough, the six or seven of us, and we pooled our money, what little change we had amongst us, together. And we had a little layover in Washington, D.C. And somehow we selected the oldest member of the group to make a speed run into downtown Washington, D.C. And he got back on the train with a shopping bag full of booze. Now, I have no idea how much booze it was, what kind of booze it was. It don't make a hell of a lot of difference now. And that night I got drunk. And it was the greatest night in my young life. Now I was one of the guys. You know, I remember walking into... You know, I didn't have a convulsion. I felt good. I didn't have a seizure. I didn't shoot a cop. I didn't do none of them horrible things. Jesus, it was a, a transformation into a whole new area, you know. And I walked into the dining car, and I remember the gentleman who was serving me, he says... Can I help you? And I looked at him. I said, you know who I am? And he said, no. And I said, I'm a rodeo star. I just come back from Cheyenne, Wyoming. And a little while later, there was a little old lady sitting alongside of me who didn't give a damn who the hell I was, you know. And I told her I was an aerialist with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. And someone else helped me into the berth that night, and I told him I was the first mate on a ship that had just come back from Reykjavik, Iceland. I discovered the magic. I discovered that all I had to do was have this thing, whatever the hell this thing was. And with this thing, I could become anything, anybody I wanted to be, just by drinking it. It was the greatest discovery for me since gold. If I was to have gotten a warning, and I probably did like all of us did, only I didn't recognize it was the very next day. Because they pulled this train into the most godforsaken place you have ever seen in your life. A place called Port Royal, South Carolina. I don't even know why the hell they ever gave it a name. Because there is nothing there. <laughs> it is a swamp. That's all it is, is a swamp. <laughs> and that's where they bring the recruits. And the Marine Corps does things strange, you know. They bring in there at 5 a.m. And if you're an alcoholic, you know that's the most ungodly hour of the day, you know. It's not light, it's not dark, you don't know whether you're beginning or ending or what the hell. You know? <laughs> and in this swamp, they got all them kind of trees that look like they're dead. You know, all that crap hanging down from them, you know. <laughs> Things are flying through there, like that. <laughs> and the water is warm, so when the cold air hits it, like steam. It looks like where Dracula hangs out, you know. <laughs> like Horrible place. <laughs> And I got down out of the train, you know, and I'm experiencing my first hangover, you know, I'm, I want to die, you know, I want to die and I'm sick and I'm shaky. And that's when I saw the first real Marine I was to see. And he didn't have on one of them fancy outfits, you know. That guy was about five foot eight. And he was five foot eight every way you looked at him, he was five foot eight. And he had no neck, his head came right out of his chest, and it was bright red. He wore Smokey the Bear hat. He came wild enough to me like a one-legged duck, you know, like <laughs> and a little swagger stick underneath and spitting, half spitting anyhow, right into my face, you know, he says, Well, I guess we got another one of them New York slickers. Here, yeah. Jesus Christ, that, here, yeah, we're like a javelin, you know. <laughs> Alcoholics are familiar with alcoholic rage. And that's when your actions overrule your common sense. And I struck out and I hit this guy. And that's not the way to as to any branch in the military, you know. I spent the first 72 days of my Marine Corps career in the Paris Island brig. But the only reason I tell you that is because it was in there that I was going to commit for the first time in my life the same error that alcoholics commit entirely during their practicing alcoholic days. I wasn't going to seek out the best possible advice. Because here I am sitting in the brig. I'm 16 years old, I'm away from my mother for the first time in my life. As tough as I'm trying to appear, I'm scared to death. I don't know what the hell is gonna happen to me, I don't really know what I've done. Anybody in that brig except one guy could have told me what was the dope. There was a sentry guarding the cell that I was in. He could have told me. There was a guy sitting at a little desk a few feet away who was called the Corporal of the Guard. He could have told me. Every now and then a sergeant would come by. He was the sergeant of the guard. He could have told me. 
There was a second lieutenant that come around about every hour or so. It was called the commander of the guard. He could have told me. And then a big shot would show up every few hours called the officer of the day. He could have told me. I didn't ask any one of them guys. I asked the guy in the cell with me. <laughs> you have done that a thousand times. You think you're going to die, right? You don't go to a heart specialist, you go to a bartender. Tell them out with me. <laughs> you look, I'm going to die. Give me a drink. <laughs> you know what this educated genius tells me in the cell with me? He said, what'd you do? So I related my little incident. He said, you hit him? I said, yeah. He said, did he have anything on his arms? I said, yeah, I had three of them red things on there. He said, you hit a sergeant. I said, well, you know, mistake. What the hell could they do with that? He said, well, this is wartime. He said, that's punishable by a general court-martial. You struck a non-commissioned officer. He said, they can do one of three things to you. I said, they're like what? And then it got serious. He said, they can shoot you with a firing squad. <laughs> they can hang you by your neck. Or they can confine you in a naval prison for the remainder of your life. Those were and still are sentences as a result of a conviction for a general court-martial. They could have legally and technically done any one of those things. Of course, they didn't. Well, wow, that's a hell of a trip to lay on a 16-year-old kid that's away from his mother. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to admit it, man, I started to cry. I was scared to death. And I said that night, the thing that I was going to say continually through my drinking career, in your heads because you know exactly what it was. <laughs> oh, God, dear. <laughs> Get me out of this. <laughs> and I'll never do it again. You know. Well, I wouldn't stand here for the rest of the day and bore you with a blow-by-blow -blow description of my military career and the things that happened as a practicing alcoholic. I did the same things and some of the things you didn't do, and you did some of the things that I haven't done, but we all wound up in Seaside, Oregon on April 14th. <laughs> and that's really all that matters. I don't want to tell you about prisons, skid road, jails, institutions, and all of that. But the most horrible thing I could tell you is the horriblest thing that ever happened in my life, which turned out to be one of the greatest things in my life. I am a very fortunate member of Alcoholics Anonymous. My wife is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have two sons, my oldest and my youngest, who are successful members to this date of Alcoholics Anonymous. But my oldest son, Steve, when he was but an eight-year-old lad, as a result of me breaking a very definite promise to him as a result of my drunkenness, justifiably, justifiably, as a young baby, spit right into my face. And said, don't you ever tell anybody that you're my father. And he walked out of my life for 11 years. And four years ago, he came back into my life. <laughs> and he said those words that you said and that I've said and a million others like us have said. Dad, I think I'm an alcoholic and I need some help. <sighs> That's why we're here. That's why we're here. That's why we are what we are. I am extremely proud to be an alcoholic. And the pride grows more and more each day, and it's not an egotistical pride. Please let me share something with you that's really not AA, but it's so much a part of how I feel now. About a year ago, I was invited to participate at a non-AA alcoholic type event, like seminars and things like that that the normal people put on, you know. <laughs> and they always invite one of us, you know, as a token alcoholic, so they say, hey, there's one, you know. <laughs> well, I've been, as I said, I, you know, I've been here a long time, and for a long time like you, I've been hearing alcoholics berated and put down. Our whole life, people have been kicking us and knocking us and calling us weak-willed and we lack courage and all that. And because of our discipline obtained in AA, and because we're bound by a moral obligation to our program's traditions, we don't engage in any controversy and we don't get up and argue with these people. We just, you know, let them sick assholes say it. And, and that's it, you know. And I have been taking it and so have you for many, many years. Well, this particular weekend that I was experiencing was extremely heavy. Boy, they got on my case on Friday afternoon and they never let up. They were vicious, boy. 
There were psychologists and psychiatrists who were also members of the clergy and had no specific denomination. There was representatives of all denominations there. And they were all in chorus. They were all agreeing, you know. And the main crux of the whole thing was that we are very weak-willed people and that, and that we lack courage and we're the outcast of the world and we're disgusting and all that. And, and I sat there, you know, taking it, saying, Jesus, get this thing over with, you know. And then, you know, a strange thing happened on Sunday afternoon. They had what they called the wrap-up session. And they put a bunch of these tables up on the porch and they put all the participants up here behind the table. They put your name out in front. And then all of the people can ask questions, you know. Well, this big redneck bigot, that's all I can talk about, you know, who was sort of the leader of this thing, was up there expounding, you know, and sweating at the collar. He smelled like he hadn't had a bath in a year. And, and he had been the so-called big speaker the night before and he had really come down on the alcoholics, you know. And, and I was furious. I really was furious. I'm ashamed to say that in a way because I, anger really had control of me. My butt was just puckering, you know. <laughs> and it was red hot, you know. <laughs> and then he made one hell of a mistake. Because they were just about to end this thing and he says, is there anything you'd like to add, Mr. Duffy, before we close? And I said, you're goddamn right. <laughs> I'm ashamed to tell you that this was born out of anger. And it was born out of malice. But as it nurtured itself inside of me over a period of time, I have now come to believe every, every word of it. And I'm so proud of it. And I know it's true. They say that you and I lack willpower. They say alcoholics are weak will. Is that right? God damn right it's not. It's quite possible and I'm sure that the alcoholics is just the opposite. We are the strongest willed people who walk the face of this earth and we have the proof of it. The proof of it is right here with us. Has there ever been a time in your life when you made up your mind you wanted a drink and you didn't get it? 351 statutes on the law books of our country to keep us from drinking, and none of them have ever worked. <laughs> they put me in the penitentiary to keep me from drinking. I drank more in the penitentiary than I ever drank before. Where do you think Pruno was invented? By Robert Mondavi? <laughs> Who do you think discovered that by squeezing red label sterno through a sock? You could come up with a teaspoon full of half 195 proof alcohol. The guys up at Coors Brewery? <laughs> Who came up with the wisdom that you shouldn't touch blue label sterno because it's poison? All of this was discovered by guys whose desire to drink was so strong that nothing could stop them. I believe that because of the will of the alcoholic, you could take two alcoholics and literally handcuff them, take them out to the deepest part of the ditch, <laughs> chain them to a stake. <laughs> and because of the ingenuity and the cunningness of the alcoholic, it would only be a matter of time, in a very short time, that they come up with a formula for distilling sand. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> and come on, this guy says that we lack courage. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. <laughs> his remark that we lack courage just expressed, you know, the obvious ignorance on his part. I didn't even think he knew what courage was. He certainly didn't know what alcohol was to the alcoholic. He didn't know about what dilemmas are to you and I. I love words. I study words, you know, and the word dilemma always fascinated me. It's used in, it sounds like, you know, something's going to happen, you know. <laughs> in the book, it says, you know, lack of power was our dilemma. And then there's another place in AA Comes of Age, I believe, this is one piece of literature, it says that most of us will experience a period of dilemma prior to making a decision as to whether to seek out recovery or continue on in our madness. It's in some pamphlet of them. But dilemma sounds great. So I asked, we had a school teacher at that time we did, in, in our group, Paul, 
And I asked him, I said, Paul, I don't know too much about, uh, you know, words. I said, what the hell does dilemma mean? I said, I looked it up in a dictionary, and I don't quite understand it. And he says, well, it is in words that you don't understand, Duff. He says, dilemma is like when you have the opposite answers to the same question, and both answers are right. <laughs> I think this guy's going into er early male menopause. <laughs> How the hell can you have opposite answers for the same question? So he says, well, he says, think about it the next time you're taking an inventory or looking back in your drinking career. I don't know when that happened, but shortly after talking to him, I was thinking about it, and then I recalled, yeah, a dilemma will precede your decision to whether to continue to drink or go on with your madness, you know. And I remembered that. I used to do my social drinking in a place called Big Rothschilds on West Madison Street in Chicago, Illinois, a scumbag of a place, a scumbag of a place. Chicago Skid Row, horrible place. I get offended sometimes when I hear people make jokes about Skid Row and comedians make funny remarks. I never saw, I was there for a year and a half. I never saw anything funny in my life on Skid Row. And I never saw anybody laughing on Skid Row, only unless it was out of a sheer display of insanity. It was a terror. It was a terror. I, sometimes I rationalized my drinking more from terror than I did from alcohol because I was scared to stop drinking. I was scared what was going to happen when I was drinking. I didn't know if I was going to wake up in the morning with my feet, my ankles, my toes, or shot, or some kid throw a can of gasoline on me and burn me up because those were the things that were daily occurrences there. And I had leveled myself to that bottom, if that's it. And I can remember going into Rothschilds one morning as I went in every morning, and there's no need anymore for vocal communication now. You're a standard. They know you. It's four ounces of cheap wine in a seven-ounce Pepsi-Cola cup. Cost you 15 cents. And you sit there. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a skid row, a physical skid row. For those of you who haven't, let me tell you a little secret. A secret that we don't really like to share with you, but it's the truth. All alcoholics cry on Skid Row before they take their first drink. All of them. Don't let any one of them ever tell you he doesn't. You see, that's the only time in that 24-hour period that we're going to really be into reality. It's at that moment that we know not only what we have done to ourselves, but what we have done to all around us. We know how hopeless and useless we are. And you cry, and you cry. Because you don't really want to be like that. You don't really want to be like that. And I think that's the thin thing that separates the drunkard from the alcoholic. The alcoholic is concerned about that. The drunkard is not. What the hell? I'll be all right tomorrow. That's how they talk. Alcoholic says, no, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be like But he's just scared to stop. Scared to death to stop. And that's when you face the dilemma. I remember looking at that glass, you know, that cup, fully aware as you were, that Jesus Christ, if I drink this, it's going to kill me. I knew it was killing me. And yet in the back of my head, something else is saying, but if you don't drink it, you're going to die. That's a dilemma. That's when you have to make that decision. Will I reach out for the help? Oh, will I go on in my madness? Will I go on in my madness? And that's what this guy didn't understand. He didn't understand, as you and I, how important alcohol is. Many of us in this room right now have said at one time or another in our life, Jesus Christ, give me a drink before I die! And meant it! Thought you were going to die if you didn't get a drink! That's not a theory! That's not a thought! That's a fact! Good God, if I don't get a drink, I'm going to die. And then something happens. Something happens that ignites a kind of courage that I have never known or seen in my entire life. You relegate yourself to a life of 20-minute intervals. From one drink to the other, that's all you're living for. Just as soon as you get a drink, the only other thought you have is, will I get another one in 20 minutes? Or will my life end in 20 minutes? And then a stranger, in most cases, comes into our lives. Think about it. 
Somebody you hardly ever knew. Somebody you at least expected. And he says the most insane thing that you've ever heard. You want to do something about your drinking? <laughs> yeah, give me more. <laughs> ever think about stopping? And you look at this madman. And while you're looking at him with sort of a scorn, you can't help but notice he's got a clean shirt on. And there's a crease in his pants. And there's a twinkle in an eye that you haven't seen in a long time. You say, I get out of here. You don't know what the hell it's all about. If I stop drinking, I'm going to die. What's that you say? You know. How the hell do you know? And as you say that, you notice his hair is combed back right. And there's no dirt under his fingernails. He says, yeah, I was like you once. <laughs> you were never this bad. <laughs> And he says, oh, no. And as you're ready to rebel against his thoughts, he tells you his story. And then you do the damnedest thing, a thing you never thought you'd do. You don't want him to know you're thinking that, though, so you sort of cover it up with a false sense of toughness. But down deep in your gut, you know, you're saying, Jesus, I'd like to be like him. I'd sure like to see my kids again. I'd like to have a clean shirt. I don't really want to be like this. But it's too late for me. I've only got 20 minutes. Maybe I should have had a desire a little bit sooner. And then this stranger says something like, Come on, try. I'll stay with you. It'll be all right. Yeah, right. And then the sick alcoholic, without any guarantee, without any evidence that it's going to work, takes the only thing that he has left, his life, only thing he has, and he literally places it in the hands of a stranger. And he says, I'll try. Never have I ever seen courage like that. Thank you very much for having me here.